rivers, the mountains, the bears are pretty characteristic of this area. So yeah. anyway, so where are we going? We're going where this yellow mark is. This is Kamchat, the Kamchatka Peninsula. Just to put it in perspective, um, where you can see this little area here, that's Moscow. Europe is over here and America is across, off the right hand side of the screen. So flying from Moscow to Kamchatka is really interesting. It's about a seven hour direct flight. And in that seven hours, it's further than flying from New York to LA, for example. And in the whole time you go, it's dark underneath, apart from a little bit around here, which is where the Mir Diamond Pipe is, which is floodlit. So you fly for seven hours and see nothing, quite literally. Arrival is interesting. You land in Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky, which is about here, at the International Airport. That's when you start to get your first surprise. So, oh, I've got slides out of order, I'll come back to it. Um, so, this is what you see when you arrive. This is Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky International Airport. This is Terminal 2, which is the arrivals building. And you kind of start to realize what's happening when you turn up in a brand spanking new 777 aircraft and they have to leave it on the runway because it's the only place the bloody airport big enough to turn it around and you start to see what you're letting yourself in for. So here's a map of the, the Kamchatka Peninsula. The interesting things to note are this Okotsk block is pretty stable. Tolbachik is here amongst a number of other mountains. So each of these little dots represents a volcanic, an active volcanic area. The, thing, the interesting thing to note is you've got a fault here. The bearing block is moving that way and this is the Aleutian Island chain. And the Aleutian Islands were formed over a mantle hotspot. So they're volcanic, all of them, and the primary volcanic um, material, if you like, is basaltic. This piece here, the Pacific Plate, is actually traveling in the other direction and it's getting subducted along this trench underneath the Okotsk block. So the Pacific Plate is moving that way, as the arrow suggests. And so it's no surprise you have a line of volcanoes along, along the, the fixed side of the trench. So the Pacific Plate is going underground below the Okotsk block there, so you get a line of um, shield volcanoes and they're very similar to places like Mount St Helens and Mount Fuji. The interesting thing is that shield volcanoes by their very nature erupt what's being stuffed underneath them and so the material coming out of these volcanoes is rhyolitic but the material along the Aleutian arc from a, a volcanic mantle plume that lies under here now is basaltic so you get some very very strange things happening. This is it's actually a space oblique photo of the area. This is uh, Kluchevsky erupting. And here are the Tolbachiks. This area is called Tolbachik Doll, which means it's kind of like Yellowstone. It's a big mountain area. This is Ostry Tobachik, Sharp Tobachik, and this is Plosky Tobachik. Ostry Tobachik is a shield volcano, typical one. Plosky Tolbachik is a, a basaltic, it's like Mauna Loa, so it has an enormous caldera in the top. And so if you look at it from, from altitude, looking downwards, here's Kliachevsky, it's actually erupting when this photograph was taken. This circular area is the equivalent of Yellowstone, and it's about oh, 100 miles across and a couple hundred miles north to south. And so when people say to me, well, you know, if Yellowstone erupts, it's a problem. Yellowstone's about the size of this little bit. And this is significantly bigger. And hey, it is erupting and nobody notices, you know. So about 10 years ago, if you guys remember, um, Ayatla, Ayatla Yerkel in Iceland erupted and shut down air traffic all over the world. 
uh, for a couple of years as, as the ash drifted. The eruption I'm going to show you that produced the live field shown down here uh, was roughly 10 times the size. And it's so bloody remote, nobody even noticed you. So here's Tobacic doll from the ground. This is Ostry Tobacic, Sharp Tobacic. And this is Plosky Tobacic, which has the Cordera in about here over the top. And it's not, not a trick question. How many volcanoes can you see in this picture? Anybody? Well, actually there are 11 in this picture, believe it or not. Um, this is the Boca Ridge where we're going to talk about and this is this is uh, Kiziman and Bismiani here and a bunch of other things and the whole area where my cursor is is volcanic and eruptive and this is a fissure eruption kind of like Mordelawa makes and that is a northward extension of what was called the Great Fissure Eruption. I'll come back to that. So getting to go there is an interesting exercise in itself. <laughs> you don't get £200 for passing go, but what you do require is 91 separate permits just to go there. It is what is called a strict national park. Uh, it is literally about a thousand miles from anywhere. It's a two-day drive from Petropavlos into Tolbachik and there is absolutely nothing there. It's also an active military area and <laughs> we were miles from here anywhere. One of the girls we had with us, they climbed up a hill and she found she, her cell phone work and she could talk to her boyfriend back in Moscow. So, yeah. Anyway, here's the International Airport. Now you, you you probably know how big a 777 is, it's got about 400 people in. And this building here is the arrivals terminal too. And you've got to get, all, you've got to get everyone in there, get your passports done, get your baggage, get through customs, etc. And it isn't much bigger than a sort of small, small little town hall. Um, and as I say, it kind of tells you what you're getting into. Anyway, here's the A team. No particular order. This is um, Lydia Fergusova. This is uh, Stanislav Filatov. This is Oleg Sidra. This is Eugenia. This is Luda, two of the girls who were with us. And all these faces will appear time to time again. So the interesting thing is these three people here, the guy behind is a geologist, Oleg and I, we're all professors and this was quite a high powered team and it's something run by the Institute of Volcanology of the Far Eastern branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences. I've been working with Russian colleagues at this institute and others for a number of years which is how I got into it and <laughs> getting the permits was sufficiently difficult. I failed twice. And eventually I spoke to a friend of mine called Sergei Krivovichev who is on the, the science advisory board for Vladimir Putin and I got back this nice letter all written in Cyrillic which of course I can't understand. All of a sudden all the bloody problems disappeared you know. I found out letter, later that the letter said this person is a, an esteemed scientist and a friend of the Soviet Union give him whatever he needs. Because Kamchatka, it's a strict national park and in Russia all natural resources are the property of the Russian state and you're not allowed to remove even a, a pebble without uh, the right permit. So anyway, so here's the Institute of Volcanology here. Uh, this is the front entrance. Round the back we were busy loading the truck. Now these are interesting trucks. They're, ex-Russian army vehicles. This one's a six by six. It's got a ground clearance of about four feet and big balloon tires and believe me you need them. The other interesting thing is all the drivers are ex spetsnaz people, Russian special, special forces and <laughs> they're really nice people to talk to and so one of them, the first day I was there, the driver of the vehicle came up to me and said, oh, my name is so-and-so, 
I am a communist, is that a problem? And I said, no, and we had a good debate. And so for the next couple of weeks while I was there, every morning one of these vehicles would drive past and you'd hear this voice yell across the, uh, the valley, Dobre Ultra Scientist, good morning scientists. And we all yell back, Dobre Ultra Communist, you good morning communist, everyone a wave and smile. And they are some of the nicest people I've ever met. Um, so I'd hate to have to fight with them because when they get started on something, they're bloody unstoppable. But, you know, people are people and they're, they're really nice. So we load up the wagon, we go off into the wild. This is what Kamchatka looks like. It's a bit deceptive because the road's on the embankment, but these are about 50, 60 foot trees. And you're looking across the Kamchatka River here. Uh, which is a low area running up the centre of the peninsula and uh, this is another range of mountains in the background and we're going up the road that way through Milkovoa to the local local metropolis with about 200 people and we come off there and turn right so at Milkovo, the main claim to fame is the the Russian castle it's wooden it was built in the 15th century um, and they have as well a chapel of about the same age. Uh, I kind of had to be careful with this picture because here's the Kamchatka River again. And these are the local kids are all skinny dipping in the river. And so I thought, well, I better be careful the way I take photographs here. They thought it was hilarious, you know. We go along a bit up the road to a place called Posyrevsk. If you look online, you can find a Tobachik webcam. This is it up the top of the tower. This is the microwave dish that beams it back to the left, back down to the Institute of Science, the Institute of Volcanology, back at Petro Pavlovsk. And so you can go online, search for Tolbachik web webcam, and you'll get a picture out of here. This is a seismic monitoring station because the area is so active, it's, it's continually under, under watch. While we were there, there were three volcanoes erupting as uh, you know just as we went <laughs> this one i put in specially this is this is camp jacker's most numerous residents i don't know if you can see them little dots here 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 they're mosquitoes the bloody things are about the size of a small airplane and so to me the the, the lasting smell of camp jacker is deep and the buzzing noise of bloody mosquitoes flying off you. Oh, the other thing is, if you go fishing in this lake, there's lots of sturgeon in here, and lots of salmon, there. and that, that too is a major industry in this part of the world, caviar. So we go north and Posy Revs, up that tar road, we turn off the tar road, we, we come in here, if you can see where the tire tracks are, and the main road, which is what it is, it goes across this little ford and up the other side here on the way to Tolbachik. And you can see what the vegetation is like. It's pretty indicative of, of what the whole area is like. Now we're back on the main road. It's the same bloody great track. You can see what the vegetation is like. So we go along a little bit further, a day and a bit. And eventually you get your first view of the Tolbachik lava fields. This is what it looks like when you first see it. And remember, these are 50, 60 foot trees with the lava field in the background. Looks quite benign. But if you get up in the air, it isn't quite as safe as it appears. Um, these lava flows advance very slowly, about one or two meters, you know, a month in some cases. But they're burning down all the trees and the vegetation. And when you finally get up onto it, our track again, we find that we're actually, everyone know what a pyroclastic flow is, yeah? We find they're actually sitting on the surface of a pyroclastic flow and the the source vent of the pyroclastic flow is off to the right here, about 35 miles. The pyroclastic flow in the direction off behind me is about three miles wide and it's 100 meters thick. So it's a hell of a bloody flow. It's about 10 times the volume of rock that came out of Mount St. Helens. 
And this one came out in 2013, and I say nobody even bloody noticed. So we go a little bit up to the right on the pyroclastic flow, and hey, you start to find more. Oh, what a surprise. So we pitch camp, here's our, here's our track again, our, our tents and everything. And if you go up here and around behind this thing and up the rise, you, you start to come to the area I'm gonna show you. This is our baby track, which is our local transport. GFE is great fishery eruption. And this guy also spets that person. He's, his name is Oleg. Um, he too is a really nice guy. I made friends with him. If I wanted anything, he'd come and take me. So going off to the great fishery eruption, which happened in 1975. Um, as you can see here, weird things come out of it. Now, again, because you've got two types of volcano, very close, a shield volcano and a, a, um, a basaltic volcano. The, they're so close that the plumbing of these two volcanoes mixes underground. So you get some very peculiar results. The shield volcanoes are rhyolitic and they're like stromboli. They explode without, without any warning. And what you get with these big pyroclastic flows. The other volcanoes are over a magma plume and they're basaltic like more or lower. So you get some very strange things happening. Out of the shield volcanoes come off the ocean floor. The ocean floor is covered with what are, what are basically manganese nodules. And so they get sucked down into the subduction zone. They melt and what was in them comes out of the volcano. So you get a lot of thallium, you get a lot of vanadium, you get manganese, you get copper, you get pretty weird things. And so here are the first and the second cones. The northern breakthrough, 1975 great fishery eruption. This is from the bottom. This is the first scoria cone where peculiar thallium vanadium minerals come from. This is the second scoria cone. And if you've heard of the tenorite fumarole and the arsenate fumarole and everything else, they're actually up here on this, this thing here. They look quite small from here. This is the entrance to the path up the cones. If I tell you it's a solid two hour climb to get to the top, you'll get some idea of the scale of these things. This is what they looked like when the eruption was in full swing back in 1975. And yeah, 2014, I said we have a whole armada of B-52s across here. You see these little things buried? They're actually lava bombs about the size of me that come down and buried themselves completely in the rubble, got filled in by little bits. And all across this area, you can see them. And they've, they're what came up of that, out of that cone when it was erupting. And they've gone up so bloody high, they've dug themselves into the ground when they come down. Here's the view from the top of the second cone. And it should, sort of shows the scale a little bit better. There's the vehicle we were in when I took the picture at the bottom. Here's the little hut. And here's the start of the path that comes up. So it's about a, a solid two hour climb from where that vehicle is to where I am now. And these are some of the minerals that come off the first scoria cone. Shabiniite, vanadium oxide, it's this thing here. Shabiniite, Markininite, it's greenish white and there's a most obvious one at the bottom down here and a few more little ones around. And this is pofluorite, which is vanadyl sulfite, a very peculiar thing indeed. And yeah, some of these come out. There's none of them in situ anymore. This is an old piece. Um, it's actually one of the best ever found that I was given. So yeah. More interesting minerals. Evdokimovite is a thallium vanodyl sulfate. Um, most of this is evdokimovite. I've got Bob Jonesite, which is a pale blue mineral, most obvious down here. Uh, 
Bob Jonesite is also known from somewhere in 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 the west of the U.S., uh, which is about about the only place that it comes from outside of Kamchatka. Here's more. Carpovite is a thallium vanadyl sulfate. Again, very very rich example here. Marquininite is a thallium bismuth sulfate, and most obvious again down here. Now I've got all these pieces and some to exchange and stuff. If anyone wants any, drop me a line. The second scoria cone is far better known. It's younger and therefore hotter than the first cone. <laughs> and this is what it looks like at surface. Here are a couple of Russian geologists. This is Vitaly, who's the other, one of the other professors I talked about. They're working hard in natural habitat. And they're now even working hard like this in their natural habitat. They find some interesting things. The thing that attracted me about this rock when I saw it was the color of the damn thing. It's, it's almost an azurite blue, but it's actually more purple if that makes no sense. So immediately I went and grabbed it and had a look at it. If you turn the magnification up, this is what it is. It's a mineral called bradaxakite, which is sodium copper arsenate, the purple johillerite, where this one is Cu4. Johillerite is MGZN3CU, so there's a series between them. I don't know if you can see it, but can you see these little purple dots here? Here, here, here. Those are the johillerite. The rest of it is bradaxakite, and they're both extremely rare minerals. Johillerite, this piece I gave to Mike Rumsey at the AHM because Joe Hillerite has been found at Sumer, but he wanted to see if they were the same. This one had quite a lot of Joe Hillerite on, so I gave it to Mike. It's actually the end of this piece here, if you can see where I'm pointing. We, <laughs> we took the big bit back to the Institute of Volcanology, and we used what I will describe as a Russian rock breaker. We put the damn great piece of rock on one of these a cast iron crucible about two feet high and about 18 inches wide. We put a fire axe on it and then we hit it with another of these bloody crucibles. Uh, and you get this satisfying dong ring throughout the building. And the piece of rock broke. So I brought the bits home with me. Here's our Eugenia again. She's in the Tenorite fumarole, which is actually this piece of rock around here. And it's called the Tenorite fumarole because guess what you get? Hey, look, Tenorite. This one, these crystals are about half an inch long, 12 millimeter field of view across here. And they are quite large. You get up to about an inch, some of them in exceptional conditions. But sometimes you get very nice ones here, straddling cavities. And here, this greenish material is something called pipiite. <laughs> I called it pipiite, but they got very upset about that. It's an another of the weird, it's one of the weird sulfates, sulfate chloride uh, that occurs here. So, if you guys can see me on the photo, can you see what I'm holding here? Yes, no? Yes. Yeah. Well, this is a piece of the Tenorite scale fumarole. Um, as you can see, bits falling off it. It's saturated throughout with Tenorite, like the one I had before, up to about 12 millimeters or so. Um, and so people say that people take chemicals up there and synthesize Tenorite specimens to sell. Uh, Put it bluntly, it's complete garbage. First of all, it's a two day drive and about a six hour climb up the hills to get there. Secondly, nobody could be bothered. Because it's an active area, all you have to do is dig a hole, throw a few rocks in it, and come back a month or two later, and you've got a piece like that. So, any of these tenorites you see generally are natural. Here, 
this is this is again is a bunch of rocks that have been thrown in uh, to a hole we dug, got these things out of. And as you're digging, you come across these green pieces. Most of them are euchlorine, which again is a potassium, sodium, car, copper carbonate, copper sulfate. Um, makes interesting crystals, but <laughs> this is a slightly different mineral. Can you see a piece I'm holding? Can you see what happens to whatever you wrap it in? There's so much hydrogen chloride at Tolbachic. Pretty well, every every specimen you take will eat you throw away through whatever you wrap it in, and <laughs> they eat their way through paper. So you well, first of all, you take them out; they're very hot, so you can't do anything but put them down on the floor, let them cool off. Then you wrap them in th thick brown, what I call parcel paper. About 80% of the things you pick up will eat their way through the parcel paper because of the hydrochloric acid content. So if they're cool, you take them, you put them into plastic, and about two thirds of the ones you put in plastic will eat their way through the plastic, which is sulfuric acid vapor coming off. When that happens, you put them in glass, <laughs> and a significant proportion start to edge the glass. At which point in time you say, and stop handling it because it's hydrofluoric acid. Uh, it's quite a, an unpleasant place. So this is mostly euchlorine, another little piece of bradaxakite, but look a bit there. Um, so, they're not hard to find, they're a bit tricky to pack up, a damn sight trickier to package and bring home. Along with the euchlorine, is to be succolivide, this stuff. Uh, best way I can describe it is to say the, the euchlorine is grass green. And to me, succolivide is somewhat glassier, lighter, and more gemmy. If you turn the magnification up, you start to see what it looks like. That's at about, that's about a millimeter across, that, that is, so they're quite small crystals. And then you start to get really interesting things. Lamorite beta, again, it's a, it's a potassium copper arsenate sulfate. It's, this stuff is lamorite beta. Where's my cursor gone here? These little balls. This is chalcite, this green stuff, and that's a member of the Samkrite group. Um, Again, very strange to find it up there, but it occurs quite a lot. Everyone happy so far? Am I talking too fast? Am I giving uh, them? You're going well, Rick. Okay. Remember, I can't see any of you because I'm sure- We're, we're all screen. turned off. We can't talk to you. <laughs> Thank God for that, Martin. Yeah, good pace. Good, all right. Anyway, so having been to the first scoria cone and the second scoria cone, the interesting area is Naboka Ridge. Now, because I'm translating names from Cyrillic into English, the spelling can vary. So Naboka is usually spelled like this, but it can also be spelled N-O-B-O-K-O. -O. Um, so Naboka, right, it's got N-A-B-O-K-O-I-T-E in it that comes out of out of off Naboka Ridge. And the other thing I want to say is we talk about tenorite fumarole, we talk about arsenic fumarole. Actually that's not correct. The the arsenic fumarole in on the second scoria cone is maybe a quarter of a mile long and oh, getting on to the same wide. And the whole area is steaming, so they're, they're active. The fumarole fields rather than fumarole locations. Naboka Ridge, the pyroclastic flow I showed you came out in 2013 off Naboka Ridge, so it's still very hot and it's therefore very interesting. So we went up there towards the end of the visit 
and here we're on our way you can see a bunch of us walking and can see this line of hills this is Naboka Ridge up here we're getting to this is the the, the lava field the Tobachic lava field from the 1975 great fishery eruption but it's very interesting because it's this weird mix of lava flows lava forms if you know the Hawaiian words pahoe oe and ah ah for what they do to your feet when you tread on it you've got both intermixed here you can see smooth basaltic lavas and you can see these sort of puckered rhyolitic lavas and they they form some interesting formations and areas here's it a bit closer up yeah this is a basalt this is a rhyolite and they uh, yeah you shouldn't see this geologists will tell you this is not possible but here's you know, evidence in front of your face and it's also huh, don't look down not quite as inactive as it seems 1975 to 2014 40 years and the thing, damn thing's still red hot inside so you have to be careful some of these fumaroles are very hot they melt your boots you can, smelling them is often the first indication of it and some pretty nasty gases can come out hydrogen chloride is everywhere hydrogen sulfate is everywhere if you smell garlic run because garlic is, is, is the smell you get when arsenic volatilizes in one of these very hot spaces so we're starting to climb up onto Naboka Ridge which is this piece up here and this whole area sort of stained brown is the fumarole field and it's still active and even walking along the ridge see if the video will play hydrothermal mineralogy in action that is water coming out from underground even the surface is heated to a couple of hundred degrees and so all sorts of interesting things are being deposited in here and if i stop it where philotov is standing if i'm standing there and i turn left this is what this is what you see believe it or not that hole is nearly two miles across and the lip of this volcanic vent is about 1500 feet lower than where i'm standing and this big pile of crap that formed this crater is what came out and formed the pyroclastic flow that we came up onto first it is amazing just this edge is about a 1500 foot drop as i say it is for those of you who live in what I'll call a big sky area you'd be used to the effects of perspective and, and distance and everything but to to people who live in the UK and similar sort of places it can be very confusing so going further up to the ridge here we are on the ridge we're we're looking back down these over here the first and the second scoria cones so we're looking from north to south back down the, almost the axis of the Tobachic lava field you can see these stained areas these are active fumaroles where things are coming out here's another video uh, here's Philotov and Luda sitting collecting collecting here is quite interesting if you want to collect out of one of these fissures you don't use a hammer what you do is to get a damn tin can you nail it to the end of a, about an eight foot piece of two by four you poke it in the hole and you fish after a few attempts the end of the two by four gets burnt off so you take the can off and you just nail it onto another bit and carry on going and i don't know if you'll see it if you look around here when i start the video you can see the shimmering from the heat come out yeah And the, the whole area looks like that 
and it's also interesting because it's hot this is this is an area of interesting yellow crystals i found and if you can see me i'm holding a bit of it here i said to philatov who was there with me what the hell is this and he said damned if i know and so we figured out if it was a new mineral it's going to be damn fine oh I'd, yeah and this is the stuff in situ here and if i zoom in on it this is what you get it actually turns out to be a thallium ridge atelestite and bismuth arsenate so you have a thallium bismuth arsenate these crystals are about three millimeters long if you ingest one it's going to kill you no doubt about it and this is the bokeh eye this sort of round stuff in two two and a half millimeter crystal groups that's even weirder that's a sulfate tellurate oxychloride bloody peculiar thing so there were really interesting things to go collect here if you get the chance so anyway the bokeh ridge in one of its more active phases this is one of the craters we looked at and you can see what's coming up and going out of it and so that is a quick tour through Kamchatka so anyone got any questions or anything I'm quite happy to talk to you turn the screen on so you can see me um, so over to you people yeah yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rick. That was fascinating. That was fascinating, oh, Rick. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Very interesting. Yeah. I w one thing I will say is all of us are used to collecting minerals of what I will describe as the fossils of last activity there, in places like Sumeb. This is different. This is active. I picked up this stuff, Italian Atlas, Damphinoi up on the Boca Ridge one, one day and it was getting late and we had about five miles to walk back to where we were camped so we stopped going that night it rained when we came back in the morning what had been this became this it had changed entirely into completely different minerals because the pH and the chemistry had changed and it, it just sort of brings it home you know just how dynamic this bloody stuff is uh, and it, very interesting from that point of view alone. Oh, if you want to get into the really hot places, you start to pick up pieces like this. This, believe it or not, is diopside. You get, I haven't got one handy, but you, you find as well, you find a diopside and what they call tobacic pennies. When one of these craters erupts, it's got a, a component in the rhyolite that's almost granitic in nature and the feldspar starts to crystallize very quickly and if it's moving through the air you get little flattened circular droplets about the size of a UK 5 pp for uh, an American cent coin and so tobacic pennies are very common they're made of this stuff it may, I've never ever seen anything quite as dynamic as this environment really was an eye-opener hmm. <laughs> the other funny story i must tell you is uh, sorry rick we've lost your voice can you hear me now yes yes yeah i'm yeah, back all right another an amusing story young Luda you've seen in the picture Luda Luda's a real honey she's she's about as high almost up to my shoulder she's very petite very demure and we one day we went from the boat back up to Naboka around the other side of those hills I showed you where it's forested and just walking through the forest with all the rock and rough ground you can't really see much and we came across a little clearing and in this clearing was a bloody bear sleeping now these are a black black bears grizzlies bloody great thing a huge male about two thousand pounds and it was sleeping we we're walking along and luda was with us and this bear sort of made a grumbling noise and she turned around and saw it and she screamed 
I have never ever in my life heard a noise like that. Nor this bloody bear. This is bear went from <laughs> sleep in the sun on a rock. It went about 12 feet vertically in the air and it was running full tilt before it landed again. And we could hear for the next quarter of an hour was bear sign disappearing into the distance, crashing noise. You know? <laughs> so we all found it hilarious. So yeah, I christened her Madam Siren, you know. Yeah, it really was funny. The other thing I have, I haven't put on here, it's not really mine to show, is the year before, while that crater was erupting, we're, because it's the Russian Institute, Russian Institute of Sciences, it's attached to a university and they come up every year to do volcanology field trips and they bring the students with them. And the crater was erupting. I have this wonderful video of the girls doing the dance of the little swans from Swan Lake up and down with the music and everything. And they've taken it with a telephoto lens and behind them, it looks like 10 feet behind them. You wouldn't believe the amount of shit that's coming out of this crater and going up in the air, ping, 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 coming down all around you. And so I use that as my health and safety video when I have to lecture university students or whatever on health and safety. So it isn't mine to show else how to put it in here. Um, I'm not actually sure how well video comes out over this bloody Zoom anyway, so... It actually wasn't too bad. I've, I've seen some before that have been... You know, just don't bother. But these ones were quite okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I hope so. So, they came with... This is my trusty little camera. Fits in my pocket, you know. Went up all these places where we took all these photos and videos and things. Um, so, it, it works well. So, everybody happy? Anyone got any questions? Yes. Yeah, Steve's turned the video off. I can't, can't get back on again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was a nice presentation, Rick. Thanks. I, uh, I own three micro mounts uh, from Tobacic and Second Scoria so Thank it's you. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry, Frank. I really didn't get that. You're breaking up, mate. <laughs> Oh, you right. three three micro mounts? Yeah, from Dolbachik, uh, second score account. So this was very interesting for me. That's good. So Rick, one question. Um, at the airport, there was a smallish crowd there. Do, when you say the 777, do they go in full or half empty? It, it was a normal Aeroflot flight. It was... There's one a day in each direction, and it was two thirds full. Oh, and where about three hundred people. Where do they all go? What do they do? Because they're not. I wouldn't think they'd all be scientists or whatever. No, I think most of them are still collecting their bags when that picture was taken. Because we just come out, you know. But but the people that were flying in, um, how many of those would be going up to the volcanoes? Oh, not many. Yeah. So there's other things in the area. Yeah. Kamchatka is a, a major, let me call it agricultural area. Uh, caviar in particular, salmon in particular, come out of the rivers, out of the Gulf of Kamchatka. And so you can get a, a this size jar of caviar for a couple of kopecks, you know. The locals get upset if you try to feed them caviar because they're sick of the bloody stuff. <laughs> um, I've got one, one other question from me as well. Uh, obviously the, the active nature of the environment, as you quite rightly said, uh, changes the minerals on a daily or, or, or frequent basis or whatever. Yep. Um, do those changes keep happening? So stuff that you've, you've actually taken back or sent back, uh, have they changed as well or don't you know? They do, some of them do change pretty well. All the specimens you bring, bring back from an environment like that without gas, either HCl, sulfuric acid, hydrogen fluoride. Mm. Um, because it's so hot, 
m many of the minerals are anhydrous and so they will absorb stuff in the air. So this is a piece of it's holotype of mineral called puninite, which is an anhydrous copper sulfate type mineral. It certainly isn't anhydrous anymore, you know, and it's that's a piece of white paper that was on a couple of months ago. And so, yes, they do change. The weather in Tolbachi can be quite changeable. <laughs> It's inside the Arctic Circle, but while we were there, the average temperature during the day was 31 centigrade, um, which was interesting because all the ice and everything else melted. But you also have permafrost there and you have glaciers there, and it can be very variable. And so, because the temperature changes and the humidity and moisture content change, anything near the surface is subject to change literally overnight and often repeatedly and so you start to when you get some of these crystals look at if you slice them open and look inside them they're actually zoned where they've grown multiple constituents if you want to think of it like that again it's quite interesting um so most of the species are peculiar because it's very hot there's a lot of energy it's very dry and so you get a lot of anhydrous sulfates you get vanadyl compounds you get all sorts of things that i would term at best metastable so they do change so if because this has got puninite in if i break it open there'll still be puninite in the middle but i'd have to put it in a a sealed jar of some kind and pull it out to a vacuum or else it's just going to absorb water from the air. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it does. Thank you. Now I've got a, like Frank, I've got a, a small number of specimens from uh, that area and um, what a few I, thousand more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure exactly what I've got anymore. So. Yeah. I mean, this piece is disintegrating as I sit here, you know, so mm. <laughs> I just take those bits, put them in little boxes, I've got instant swaps. <laughs> if it starts to eat the box, be, be worried, you know. <laughs> Especially if it's a glass box. Yeah. Well, no, well, yeah, you know, like thing, things like this, but this is only tenorite, so yeah, a bit hydrogen chloride in it by the smell, but if it starts to eat the plastic, worry. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a uh, rhenium sulfide mineral, rhenite. Where does oh, that rhenite. come from? Yeah. Right. That comes from a place called Kudryavsky, which is That's not near where you No, it, it's, out, it's out in the Aleutians. Um, rhenite, rhenium sulfide, disulfide. Yeah. It, it too is a fumarole product. Um, but it's an oddball set of fumaroles. You can get very similar sort of compounds of Tolbachic, but there are no plaque group metals I'm aware of with Tolbachic. These are all volatiles out of manganese, nodules, and everything else. Um, mm. So, metal metals, most of it's copper, there's a lot of potassium, a lot of sodium, a lot of sodium, a lot of vanadium. Um, yeah. Yeah, really, I, it does occur. I've got a piece around somewhere too. It's pretty. Uh, uh, are there any other questions? No? Um, hopefully I'll see a few of you guys on the Russell Society one tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think Frank is, Frank Inns is still doing his talk, I hope. Um, I'll be getting up a little bit earlier again tomorrow. I think 4.30 start for me tomorrow. <laughs> uh, it's all right. Um, Different world. <laughs> That's dedication. Uh, you've, got, you've got to do it. Um, and Colleen, if you can just unmute for a second as well. Colleen? Yeah. Yep, yep. So the, the Oxford show over the weekend, is that 24 hours or do I have to get up and stay up overnight? No, you don't. No, it, it's on... From probably from Friday night right the way through till Monday morning. Okay, um, good. 
so it's everyone's going to their photos and stuff going to be available for everyone to view there's just going to be a few couple of live um videos during the course of saturday and sunday so i'll be doing maybe a couple and a couple of the others are doing them as well so is it's it on be facebook or well. on on here sorry is it on facebook or is it on here on zoom it's on facebook okay it's a group yeah, I've, got, so, I've got all the other stuff yeah 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 so um yeah um you should find links all over the place so okay i went out with the russell society email this morning yeah, I've, got all, I've got all that from you the other day okay yeah, yeah. so yeah look forward to seeing any of you all of yeah. you yeah <laughs> Exactly. I expect to see you with purple hair, Colleen. Oh, blimey. I've got to cut it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm getting my hair cut today as well. How do you cut your own hair, Colleen? I have to. I thought I'm not allowed out of the house. I know you are, no. <laughs> my wife had hers cut for the first time last Saturday since it all started. She was she's very happy again now. Yeah, brilliant. Mine, mine is dead easy, just straight over <laughs> the top of them for the trimmer. <laughs> My wife right. went and had hers cut in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> well, on, on that note, um, stay safe everybody. Uh, yeah. I know that some people are still uh, isolated more than others. Uh, Paul, for instance, in Melbourne isn't allowed to do anything, whereas I can go out on field trips, so it's not very fair <laughs> at the moment. But um yeah just stay safe and um i'll see you in two weeks time with david with a talk yeah. on wavelight yes great stuff okay. Okay. Thank, okay, thank you thank you steve see you all all right thanks guys bye everyone bye. 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 thanks cheers bye. Enjoyable. Bye. 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 Bye.